Tonight I want to invite your attention to the book of Matthew, very familiar passage of scripture, very familiar story in the book of Matthew, and we want to lift it up and see what the Spirit has to say to the church tonight. Matthew chapter 14, and I want to lift up another lengthy passage of scripture, but I do want to read it in its entirety. It will serve as the context for the preaching. Matthew 14, beginning with verse 22 and reading through verse 32. Amen. Familiar passage. And um, I want to read from the New King James Version, beginning with verse 22. If you found it, say amen. amen. Beginning with verse 22, it reads like this. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitude away. When he had sent the multitude away, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, commit, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Uh, verse 29, so he said, Come and... When Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the And when Peter had come down out of the boat, then he walked on the water. Amen. You may be seated. With the help of the Holy Spirit in your prayers, I want to preach from the simple subject, get out of the boat. Get out of the boat. Amen. Help me preach this. Look at your neighbor. If you ain't scared, look at him. And uh, <laughs> tell him, get out of the boat. <laughs> Just in case you're scared, you can blame it on me. Look at your other neighbor and say, Pastor said. <laughs> Get out of the boat. Amen. And I would that you would flank me with your prayers. Get out of the boat. The disciples had the precious privilege and the awesome opportunity of having Jesus as their mentor. For three and a half years, wherever he went, they went. Wherever he ate, they ate. Wherever he slept, they slept. Three and a half years, he was their life coach. Imagine having the man Jesus as your life coach. I mean, Jesus, the one who is the visible image of the invisible God. Jesus, the most perfect man that ever lived. Jesus, who said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus, who's that mysterious mixture of dust and divinity, time and eternity, this world and the world to come. Jesus, the language of eternity, translated into the words of time. Imagine having Jesus, the one who was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. Imagine having him for three and a half years as your mentor, as your life coach. Jesus taught his disciples diligently and 
One of the ways in which Jesus would teach his disciples is he would choose a kind of safe classroom type setting in which to teach them. There would be times when they would sit and he would sit and he would teach them like the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Other times when Jesus taught them, it was not in a carefully crafted, safe classroom type setting because Jesus understood that some lessons are not taught, they're caught. And so Jesus takes them out of the safety and predictability of a classroom type setting and in the nip and tuck pace of life, Jesus would spontaneously and creatively choose teachable moments in order to teach them eternal truth. Whether the moments were calm or even in a crisis, Jesus had a sense of himself in such a way that even in times of trouble, he taught his disciples truth. And Jesus taught them because he wanted them to know how to live the abundant life. And when I say the abundant life, I don't necessarily mean what you hear prosperity preachers preach. When I talk about the abundant life, I'm talking about a life of poise, peace, and power. Jesus wanted to teach them how to live a life of victory even in the face of vicissitudes, triumph in the midst of trouble, how to remain poised when all hell is breaking loose. And Jesus wanted to do that because he wanted to prepare them to carry out the mission that he would bequeath to them after he had conquered sin, death, and the grave. And in the words of J.C. Perkins, leap from the craggy cloud, shrouded cleft of Olivet, catch a cloud, and work his wondrous way back to heaven. Jesus wanted them to be prepared to carry out the mission that he was mandated to pre prescribe to his disciples by his father. So Jesus was with them for three and a half years so that he could teach them to carry out his mission. And in our text today, what we have, I believe, is another example, or if you will, an illustration, an incident or scenario in Jesus' life and ministry with his disciples where Jesus takes a moment, a moment that happens to be at least in the minds and lives of the disciples, a crisis moment. But in that crisis, he takes the time to teach them how they too can stay calm in the midst of crisis and learn how to walk above their circumstances and learn how to have victory even in the face of the wind. It happened on an occasion when Jesus had fed the 5,000 with two fish and five loaves of bread. The Bible says that after he had fed them miraculously by taking it, blessing it, breaking it, and passing it, the Bible says that they were so caught up in messianic fervor that they wanted to make him a king. But this was kind of premature and kind of superficial. Jesus didn't want to be the kind of king they wanted him to be. They wanted him to be king because he had fed them with two fish and five loaves of bread and Jesus refused to be simply a stomach king. He did not want to simply be a king that promises you a chicken in every pot and bread in every cupboard because there's more to him than that. And believe it or not, there are people who still want Jesus to be a stomach king. They want what Jesus can give, but they don't want Jesus. Come on, they want the blessings without the blesser and they'll follow him as long as he promises to give them what their souls desire. And so he said, no, we can't let this happen. And so watch, the text begins by saying, and Jesus made his disciples get in the ship. King James says he constrained them to get in the ship. Sometimes you read scripture so fast, you miss so much. You ought to slow down because there's something right there. Jesus, the Bible says he constrains them to get in the ship. He made them get in the ship. Why would Jesus have to make his disciples get in the ship? Well, apparently they had got caught up in the messianic fervor of the crowd. They had become intoxicated by what the crowd wanted. 
talking about his disciples, his church. And so Jesus had to pull them away from the crowd and make them get in the ship. Because what you have here is a portrait of the church being influenced by the crowd rather than the crowd being influenced by the church. And what the church has to be ever mindful of that we will be in the world but not of the world. And the great challenge of the church is to have contact without contamination. To infiltrate and influence without being infected. To touch without being tarnished. To be voices and not echoes. Headlights and not taillights. Leaders and not followers. Originals and not copies. So y'all ain't acting right, he said. He had to make them get in the ship. But that surprise you because you know there are times in your own life. Come on, when Jesus has to make you. Oh, you don't like this tonight, do you? He has to make you do the right thing. I know you say you love him. You got a big coffee table Bible and a long, big, heavy cross. And you speak in tongues every other syllable. But there are some times when he has to make you, don't he? Uh, get in the boat. The Bible says he constrained them to get in the ship. And they got in the ship and began to sail across the Sea of Galilee. But this time, Jesus, unlike the previous time, did not get in the ship with them. You remember the last time they were in the ship, Jesus was in the ship with them. And they got caught in a storm and called his care into question. Because while they were in the ship panicking, bailing out the water while the storm tossed them like a nautical toy, Jesus was below fast asleep. And somebody said, Do, don't you care that we perish? Imagination suggests Jesus said, wait a minute, I, you can question me about a lot of stuff. But don't, don't question whether I care about you. Can't you see him getting up and wiping the sleep out of his eyes and putting a cloak over his shoulder? Can't you see him taking his time in the midst of the storm? Because, see, when you know who you are and when you know you, what you can do and when you know you got all power in your hand, you ain't got to work fast in nervous insecurity. Jesus stepped out on the bow of a ship and looked up and saw zigzag fingers of lightning playing their nimble game of hide and seek across the darkened sky. He heard the thunder roll like a million chapters rumbling on a distant battlefield. He stood like a man, but he spoke like a god. King James says, he said, peace be still, but that's not as forceful as the original language. The original language is be muzzled, contemporary translation. Shut up! And when Jesus spoke, the wind ceased his howling. And Matt Carter said, God reached down from heaven with his hand and smoothed the wrinkles out of a frowning sea. That was when Jesus was with them. <laughs> but this time, Jesus sends them and he is not physically with them. And I believe that he sends them without his physical presence because he's trying to train them how to trust him even when they can't see him. <laughs> And so he sends them in the ship and they go across. And the Bible says while they're in the ship, Jesus goes up to the mountain to pray. I wish I had time to talk about the prayer life of Jesus because we always brag about his power. But we don't talk very much about the prerequisite for his power. We talk about what he was able to do, but we don't talk about why he was able to do what he did. The reason why he has so much power on his feet is because he spent sufficient time on his knees preach pastor Williams and that's the secret to many of us all of us indeed if Jesus had to pray this must not be on if Jesus had to pray you and I are gonna have to pray Jesus has sense enough to know that you're not too busy to pray you are too busy not to pray if ever time you need to pray you need to pray now and so Jesus went up into the mountain and he was there praying the Bible says that while he was praying, the disciples got caught in the grips of a terrible storm. And it would not have been unusual for that to happen because if you know anything about the Sea of Galilee, it was not unusual for it to be calm and placid one moment and then you can be caught in the storm the next moment because it sits down in a basin surrounded by mountains on certain sides. When the wind blows, it would uh, go in between the mountains and the mountain sides would cause it to become a funnel and one moment down in the basin the Sea of Galilee would be calm and then all of a sudden the wind would hit it and they would be in the grips of a terrible storm often like life 
<laughs> because one moment things can be going just fine. Don't make me work so hard. And the next moment you could be caught in the grips of a storm. Come on, you could be feeling just fine. Go to the doctor for a regular checkup, but then he finds a spot on your lung or a lump on your breast. You're in the midst of a storm. You go to sleep at night and everything's fine. All of a sudden you get a call that your son has been arrested or your daughter is pregnant and she's only 13. You're in the grips of a storm. Your marriage is going just fine like anybody else's, but you come home and find a Dear Jane or a Dear John letter. you in the midst of a storm. You got a nice job, been there for 15, 20, 30 years, and you know you're going to retire there, but today you go to work, they give you a pink slip on the job. you in the midst of a storm. Things can be fine one moment. And then the next moment, you could be caught in the grips of the storm. And that's what happened to the disciples. They were rowing, and all of a sudden, a storm came. And they started rowing, trying their best to navigate this storm. Watch this. And when you read, I believe it's Mark, who says that by that time, watch, while they are straining in the middle of a storm, the Bible says in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus had come down out of the mountain, watch, and the Bible says he stood and watched them there. See, I told you you read too fast. Jesus, we like the part when he walks on the water, but the text says and Mark says that while they're straining, before he comes to them, he stands and watches them there. First time I read that text and saw that detail, I said, Jesus ought to be ashamed of himself. <laughs> Come on, all that power he has. And he could see the fellas out there straining in the storm. And with all of that power, he got the nerve to watch. Come on, you know if you would be honest with yourself. That there are times in your life when you were in the middle of a storm and you're wondering where Jesus is. Come on, he's not where you want him to be. Can I tell you where he is? In fact, the text implies not that he just sees them, not just he's watching them watch, but he's watching over them. That's what the implication of the text is. And sometimes he doesn't come when you want him to come. Uh, but when he comes, he'll be on time. Sometimes he takes the time to come because while you're in the storm, he wants you to learn some things in the storm that you wouldn't learn if you weren't in a storm. So he wants to see how well you do. So he's watching over you. So you'll learn how to navigate through storms. Learn how to handle storms. So he watches you there. He, but he's watching over you. Yeah. But you know, the Bible says that Jesus said that, that God won't put on you. Mm, you know the text. He won't put on you any more than you can bear. So that gives you a clue as to how long he'll watch you. <laughs> Over somebody's head. He'll, he'll watch you until it becomes too much for you. Can, can I illustrate what I mean? Uh, it's, like a, it's, like a, it's like a grandmother watching the kids play as opposed to a, a new mother. <laughs> he ain't never had kids before. She watching the kids. You, you know, when a mother just has a child, she don't have a lot of experience. So when she sits on the porch watching the kids, if their kids playing together and one of them falls, she jumps up and says, you all right? You just getting okay? Are you all right? When they start fighting, she goes, oh, no, 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 you got to love one another. You gotta... Anything that goes wrong, she jumps off the porch to go see about it, but not granny. No, not grandma. She, she's sitting on the porch, knitting, or reading a book, glasses half down on her nose. And she just watching, and if the baby falls, she don't do anything. She just look down and see what baby gonna do. The children start fighting, she don't jump right in. She just look down, see how they gonna handle it. They're riding the bike and have a little wreck. She doesn't just jump down. She waits to see what baby gonna do. The only time granny comes off the porch is when the children get into something that's over their heads, y'all. When it gets like that, here comes Granny. She's coming out the porch. And that's exactly what happens in the text. As soon as it gets too much for them, guess what? Jesus comes walking on the water. Look at your neighbor and tell him, here he comes. 
Somebody drove all the way here tonight just to hear that because you've been out there straining and wondering when he's going to show up. You say, I'm about to go down for the count. God sent me here like a FedEx man to drop a package off to tell somebody, here he comes. Help is on the way. Now, I think it's instructive as to see not only that he comes, that's good news, but I think it's important that you notice how he comes. Disciples are out there straining in the storm, in the ship, in the sea, and all of a sudden the Bible says Jesus comes, and he comes walking. Now, he's a carpenter, but he doesn't build a bridge. He doesn't make a boat right quick and sail out to them. No, no. Jesus comes walking on the water. Now, don't you miss this, because this is really instructive for anybody who's in a storm. This is what you need to know about Jesus. Jesus comes walking on the water. I'm not getting it. The disciples are out in the ship and seeing the storm on the water, and they're struggling and straining, and they're in a boat, and Jesus comes walking on the water. What shouts me is that what the fellas are struggling with, Jesus has under his feet. What I'm trying to tell you is just because it's hard for you, too much for you, whatever's got you upset and panicking, please know that it's always under his feet. I hope I can make it through this sermon, y'all. I feel like running already. Just because you can't handle it doesn't mean he can't handle it. It's always under his feet. Look at him. Look at him come walking. <laughs> Comes walking on the water. Can I take my time tonight, Reverend? He comes walking on the water and the Bible says, as he walks towards them, here comes help. They look through the mist, and here comes help, but they see help as harm. Even though it's help, they think the help is harm. And the reason why they think the help is harm is because they're looking through the lenses of fear. Because whatever your disposition is at the time you look, your disposition can determine your outlook because your disposition will determine whether you have an up look or a down look and your up look or down look determines your outlook <laughs> two men peered through prison bars one saw mud the other star both of them were in jail both behind bars but one was a mud watcher the other was a stargazer and what's in you determines where you end up looking and your up or down look determines your outlook and they were looking through lenses of fear and saw they saw help as harm. And is there anybody in here who has ever been walking with the Lord long enough to know that there are certain things that start in your life that look like they were harmful but after they came and passed by and you look back on them you realize that what the enemy meant for evil. God, I, I feel like preaching. He used for good. Uh, you thought it was harm, but it wasn't what you thought it was. Uh, the Bible says Jesus was coming and he was coming for help. And, and, and the Bible says that they, they said, it's a ghost. And Jesus said, be not afraid. It is I. Be not afraid. Cheer up. It is I. I am. That's what he's saying. Here go Emi. I am. I like that. They're afraid. It's a ghost. He says, I am. Okay, y'all ain't read your Bible. You remember? You remember when Moses asked God, whom shall I say sent me? He said, you tell him. <laughs> uh, in fact, tell him that my first name is the same as my last name. I am that I am. Come on. And when you understand what I am means, it means I am or I will be whatever you need me to be. Come on, and if there's one thing you need to hear, God, when you're in trouble, is to hear Jesus say, don't worry, whatever you need. Y'all don't know where to shout. Whatever you need, I am that I am. And, and the, Bible says, uh, the Bible says that when Jesus identifies himself, Peter, in an effort to be clear, he said, if it's you, Lord, bid me come to thee on the water. And uh, Jesus says, come. I like that. Uh, and the Bible says that Peter gets out of the boat and starts walking on the water. 
Of course, he hears the wind howling, the waves dashing at his feet, but he's still focused and fixed on Jesus. So he stays above the situation. But then after a while, he started paying attention to what was going on around his feet, what was howling in his ears. Took his eyes off Jesus and started to sink. The Bible says he cried out for help. Jesus reached down, grabbed him, picked him up, and went back to the boat, and the storm ceased. Now, that's the story, but can I just rewind the tape? Show you some stuff I think I see. Because the title of the sermon is Get Out of the Boat. And I want you to see something in the text. When I first saw it and the Holy Spirit showed it to me, I had to throw down my Bible and do a holy dance. Because, see, the text says that Jesus came walking on the water. Peter said, bid me come. He said, come. And Peter got out and was walking on the water. Now, that shouted me. Now, I was happy, but I didn't shout when I saw Jesus walk. Because after all, that's Jesus. And if anybody could walk on the water, the one who created it ought to be able to walk on the water. Mm. Jesus walking above the circumstances, the situations, even in the middle of a storm. That's good news. But that made me happy. But I'm going to tell you where I really shouted. It's not when I saw Jesus walk. I shouted when I saw Peter walk. Peter, y'all, I'm talking about old cussing Peter. I I'm, talking about, I'm talking about the one who leaps before he looks and talks before he thinks. I'm talking about the one with the knife under his robe. Oh, knife carrying, cussing Peter. Peter, with all these issues, is walking on the water. And I had to shout because I know Jesus can walk on water. But when I saw Peter walk, I said, well, shoot, if Peter can walk, maybe Jesus will teach me how to walk on water. <laughs> so can I talk about that just a minute, then I'm going to leave you all alone. Uh, preach, Holy Ghost. I, uh, so I saw Peter. I said, oh, man, I got to keep reading. I thought I knew the story. That's why you got to be careful about reading a text like you already know it. Don't you know the Bible doesn't have a bottom to it? No matter how deep you dig, <laughs> you can never get it all. Preach, Pastor Wim. And I know some of y'all, as soon as I read the text, you tuned me out and turned me off because you already know the story. Uh, but when the Holy Ghost blows on something, He'll give you something, a new perspective that you've never seen before. Can I work the text a little bit? Watch the text. The text says that, that he said, if it's you, Lord, bid me come to thee. And Jesus said, come. Peter gets out, walks on the water. And I got issues like Peter. You got issues like Peter. But did you not know? Watch. We're really impressed with the fact that Peter walked on the water. But do you not know that the only difference between Peter and most of us is that he got out of the boat? Oh, Lord Jesus. And what I'm trying to tell you is God wants to do some great things with your life. And the only thing that stands between you and the great things that God wants to do is you have got to get Get out. Get out. Look at your neighbor. Look at him. Tell him, get out. Get out. Get out. <laughs> You're so jealous watching what God is doing in other people's lives. Well, if you want to do what they do, then you've got to do what they did. you got to get out of the boat. So what does it take? What does it take? What does it take? Why do people stay in the boat? What does it take to get out of the boat? Well, if you're going to get out of the boat, one of the things you've got to be willing to do is you've got to be willing to do something unconventional, something untraditional. You know, one of the reasons why God can't do great things with our lives is we're so busy trying to be like other people instead of being like Jesus. That's why Peter got out, because Peter said, if it's you, let me come do what you're doing preach Pastor Williams and if you really want to walk on the water you've got to be willing to do something unconventional the problem with Christians and churches 
is that we are still stuck on the things that we're used to doing. We want God to do things great, but we keep on doing the same old thing. Preach, Pastor. But you've got to be willing to try something that you've never tried before so you can see something that you've never seen before and do something that you've never accomplished before. We're so stuck in traditions and and convenient little pat presuppositions that we've got God in that we're not open to a fresh wind of the spirit. God wants to do something new in your life. Preach Pastor Williams. He wants to do something unconventional because see, in these days, it's gonna take something unconventional to reach this generation. The songwriter said to serve this present age, which means that you cannot use 1950s methods to reach 2013 people. Come on, you know what we gotta learn? We've got to learn that when it comes to the church, the message never changes, but the methods have to change. In order to be effective, you have to have what I call methodological elasticity. You've got to have methods elastic enough to stretch to meet the contours of the present generation. And the reason why some churches can't grow the way God wants them to grow is because we are so busy doing what we like. So busy doing ministry that ministers to us that we're not thinking about the ministry that's effective to the people we're trying to reach. As long as they sing the songs I like the way I like them, I'm fine. As long as they have church the way I want to have, I'm fine. But don't let them change nothing to try to make room for somebody who isn't already here. Can I preach like this here? Watch, watch, watch that. It reminds me, it reminds me, it reminds me. Two things it reminds me of. One thing it reminds me of. It reminds me of those four friends who brought that man on the pallet. That lame man. Jesus was out of house in Capernaum trying to hide out. But the word leaked out that he was there. And whenever people found out Jesus was there, they would come from everywhere. And the Bible says they filled up the house. And then when there was no room in the house, they surrounded the house. And these four friends had a lame friend on a pallet who couldn't get there. But each one of them grabbed the corner. I wish I had time to talk about that. Each one of them grabbed the corner and they went over hills and down mountains and through narrow Alice trying to get this man to see Jesus. The Bible said they got there, and by the time they got there, the Bible says they wanted to get him in the house, but they couldn't get him, King James says, for the press. Or they couldn't get him because of the crowd. Watch, they were trying to get the man in to see Jesus, but they couldn't get him in to see Jesus because of the crowd. You're not getting it because I'm not saying it right. They were trying to get the man in to see Jesus. But the reason why they couldn't get him in to see Jesus is because of the people who were already there. And you know, sometimes we can't get folk in to see Jesus. The problem in the folk we're trying to get in, it's some of the people who are already here. Look, it may be my last time. I already, I already got a church, but I'm going to tell you the truth while I'm here. But you know what got to happen? We've got to be unconventional like the four men who brought the lame man. Because the text says when they couldn't get him through the door, when they couldn't get him through the usual way, when they couldn't get him through the conventional way, when they couldn't get him through the traditional way, they didn't say, well, we did the best we could. You have to fend for yourself. But the Bible says they climbed up on the roof and tore a hole in another man's roof. And sometimes you got to tear the roof off. Hey, y'all got this excuse. I told you I passed it in the hood. You got to tear the roof off. God save us from people who are addicted to the same old thing. God is too big for you to stuck in the routine and the regular. God wants to do something new. And so in order to get out of the boat, <laughs> you've got to be willing to do something untraditional. 
Then, I ain't going to keep you long. In order to, uh, to get out of the boat, you have got to be willing to be liberated from the opinions of your peers. Come on, let me just tune in on the frequency of creativity. Look, watch, imagination suggests something that when the disciples are in the ship, uh, Peter says, uh, bid me come to thee on the water. Now the Bible doesn't say, but I know people. I've been pastoring too long. And I, I bet you my next paycheck that if they were like us, as soon as Peter said, oh Lord, if it's you, let me come to you on the water. There were some people among the 11 in the boat saying, oh, here he go again. <laughs> I'm so tired of Peter. <laughs> Always trying to do something nobody else has ever done before. Always trying to try something nobody else tried before. Always pushing us in directions we don't feel comfortable with. Always trying to be like Jesus. And do you know that there are some people, two or three in here tonight, the reason why your life is so boring and mundane and uneventful is you too busy trying to please people instead of obeying God. Because it is impossible to follow Jesus and ever get bored. Because sooner or later a leper's going to get healed. Uh, sooner or later somebody dead going to be raised from the dead. Sooner or later, some blind eyes are going to be open. Sooner or later, some lame limbs are going to leap up and dance. You can't hang out with Jesus and ever be bored. Sooner or later, you're going to run into a miracle. And too many of us are too addicted to our click clubs and groups. You don't even understand that the reason why they want you to stay in the boat is because misery loves company. Can I go deeper? Because, see, I need you to understand something, that the people who are going to talk about you when you want to do something great are not always people out there. Because the text says <laughs> he was in a boat with some other disciples. And sometimes the people who are going to give you the biggest trouble are other disciples. <laughs> Can I preach it like I feel it? But you got to be willing to get out of the boat. Has it ever occurred to you that the reason why, thank you, Holy Ghost, that God wants you to get out is if you get out, somebody else might. If you would try it, they would try it. If you would do it, they would do it. Come on, if you would tithe, they would tithe. If you would forgive, they would forgive. If you would serve, they would serve. If you would do it, they would do it. Yes. Hallelujah. Maybe God chose you to be the first one. You would go to school, they would go to school. If you would keep trying, they would keep trying. So if you want to get out of the boat, you got to be willing to liberate yourself from the expectation. Of other people. Why, why you want to let other people set the standard and pace for your life? Trying to get out of the boat to see Jesus and you're going to let some other people keep you from where God wants you to be. Keep you from seeing Jesus. That's why I like Zacchaeus. Y'all know Zacchaeus. You remember? Short man, tax collector, heard Jesus was coming by. He said, I ain't going to miss this. Watch this, and the text says that he went to see Jesus, but he couldn't see him <laughs> because of the, of the crowd. But the Bible says he does two things that gives him an audience with Jesus. The first thing the Bible says is he went ahead of the crowd, which means that he did not let the crowd set the pace for his life. They were moving, but they were moving too slow. And so he went ahead of the crowd. And that's what you got to do. You can't let other people set the pace for your life. 
how bad do you want to see him? And the text not only says he ran ahead, watch, but the book says he climbed a tree. Which means that he not only went ahead, but he rose above. He rose above. And you can't let the world set the standard for your life as well. Preach, Pastor. I can't get no help in here. But you've got to learn how to rise above the crowd. If you want to get out of the boat, church, you've got to be liberated from the expectations of your peers. And then, and then if you want to get out of the boat, watch this. You, you may not shout off of this one. But if you want to get out of the boat... You've got to be prepared to step away from man-made support. Because see, the true test of discipleship is the willingness to step away at any given time from man-made support. Y'all still don't get it. Uh, I want you to notice that the boat, the boat, the boat. The boat they were in that was keeping them afloat was a boat made by men's hands. <laughs> and in order for Peter to walk on the water, he had to step out of the security provided by the hands of men. Oh, that's good all by itself. Now, there's nothing wrong with support from the hands of men because most people get some of their sense of security from what men have created. 401ks, retirement plans, a whole host of other things. A good job to go to. That they ain't nothing but a boat. <laughs> ain't nothing wrong with a boat. That's the conventional, usual way of staying afloat. But sometimes we stay in the boat so long Amen. that we start thinking that the boat yeah. is our source yeah. of security. Y'all not getting this. And every now and then, God will mess with you. And he'll call you out of it so that you can be reminded that the boat is not your source. It's a resource. God is your source. And if you would trust him, come on, you'll be able to do what other people can only do with human help. You're not getting it. Because, see, there are 13 people in the text. 11 of them are staying afloat by the boat. Two of them are staying afloat, but they ain't in the boat. Everybody's afloat. One is doing it because of what men have provided. But another way is the way God has provided. Watch. And the way it is happening, it is happening in such a way that you have to say, it couldn't have been nobody but the Lord. And you know sometimes God will call you out just so you can be testimony material. He'll call you out just so you can testify. It wasn't nobody but the Lord. Somebody say get out of the boat. Now, I think it's worth raising this real relevant question right here. This is a good question right here. I'm almost finished, but I got to raise this question. The question is, when do you know when to stay or step? I think that's a relevant question. I, I thought I was finished in preparation for the sermon, but I realized that there's another question, and that is, how do I notice when to stay in the boat and when to step out of the boat? Because, you know, there is a difference between faith and foolishness. <laughs> I'm almost finished. Can I tell you how, what you ought to do to know whether to stay or step? It's in the text. I'm going to make it up. Here it is. Pay, pay attention, wake up and write this down. If you want to know when to stay or when to step, here it is. Lord, if it's you, there it is, that's it. See, y'all thought I was going to do something deep. That is deep. Did you catch what I just said? If you really want to know whether I should stay or whether I should step, whether I should stay here or take this great big risk, before you move, you better say, Lord, <laughs> is it you? Okay, y'all not getting it. Okay, there might be somebody in here. You found your special someone. You've been single for a while, and you find your, your soulmate, your boo. You've been looking for him for a long time. And y'all start talking about matrimony. And, and I hope it is your soulmate. I hope it is your boo. I hope you found that special somebody. But can I give you some good advice? Before you step out of the ship of singlehood and leap onto the waters of lifelong holy matrimony, 
You better say, Lord, is it you? Come on, talk to me. Whenever you are about to make a decision like that, whether it be a raise, whether it be another job, whether it's relocation, whether it's leaving the church, you better say, Lord, is it you? My God, my God. Uh, I done kept you too long. I done kept you too long. Can I finish it up, though? Can I finish it? Can I, can I have eight and a half more minutes? Can I just... <laughs> so, so the Bible says... That Peter said, Lord, if it's you, bid me come to thee. Watch. And the text says, Jesus says, come. Now, the one thing about scripture is we know what it said, but we don't know how it said. We don't know how he said what he said. I don't think that when Jesus said come, it was like a Cecil Beale to me, Mills movie. I don't, I don't think the wind was howling and blowing and Jesus stood on the sea and said, come. I don't, I don't think it happened like that. I'm not exactly sure how it happened, but I don't think it happened like that. Well, Jesus said, come, and I think there was a particular attitude that accompanied his word. Can I tell you what I think his attitude was? When Peter said, Lord, if it's you, bid me come to Jesus uh, on the water, I think his attitude was this. Oh, I've been waiting for somebody to ask to get out. I'm so tired of disciples staying in the boat. I've been waiting for somebody to take a risk. All this teaching and all these miracles and they still want to stay stuck in the boat. I'm so glad that finally someone had the nerve, had the faith, would take the risk, would trust me enough to try something so crazy that if I don't get involved, it can't be successful. And what did he stand on? Can I tell you what he stood on? Because y'all think he stood on the water. He didn't stand on the water. He stood on the word. And can I show you how powerful the word is? All he needed was one. All he said was come. Is there anybody in here who knows that there is power in the word? Come on, is there anybody in here standing on the word of God? Preach, Pastor Williams. I can't get no help in here. Now watch, watch. The text says, the text says that he said, uh, if it's you, Lord, bid me come to thee on the water. And the Bible says, Jesus said, come. And the book said that Peter stepped out on the water. And Peter started walking on the water. The only one who's ever been able to say that I walk just like Jesus did. The Bible says he's walking on the water and all of a sudden the wind, he noticed that there was a storm around him. Now he's walking on the water in the middle of a storm. I don't know how you feel about it, but that makes me shout right there. Because that lets me know that God doesn't have to change your circumstances to give you the power to handle your circumstances. But right in the midst of a storm, God can give you peace. Is there anybody in here who knows that God can give you peace in the midst of the storm? Peace that surpasses all understanding. Bruce Williams translation, peace that just don't make no sense. Have you ever been in a situation when it was swirling all around you and you knew you should be afraid? You know you should be crying. You know you should have insomnia. You know you should be wringing your hands. But in the midst of it all, you've got a strange kind of peace. You can't manufacture that. You can't sip that. You can't snort that. Can I get a witness in here? You can only get that from the one who is the Prince of Peace. Well, my Bible says that he's walking on the water. He's got his eyes on Jesus. He stays above his circumstances as long as his eyes are fixed and focused on Jesus. But then the text suggests that he gets distracted by what's going on in his ears. The wind is howling in his ears. The waves are dashing at his ankles. He's ignoring them, but they keep on howling in his ears because as soon as you get out of the boat and start walking, 
nothing. It's always going to be somebody telling you, you better get back in that boat. You have lost your mind. You're going to sink after a while. But you got to learn how to ignore all gate mouth prognosticators and just keep on walking. Well, the Bible says that after a while, he let the situation get the best of him. And don't be so hard on him because the truth is there's a whole lot of us who let the circumstances get the best of us. The Bible says that that when he took his eyes off Jesus he started sinking and every now and then on the high seas of life when you take your eyes off Jesus you gonna sink there might be somebody in here who's wondering if sometime in the future you ever gonna sink let me put your mind at ease yes you will you are going to sink but can I tell you what to do when you start going down don't be like some saints who act like ain't nothing wrong who pretend like they got it all together they going down for the count the water's about to go over their mouth and over their nose and you ask them how you doing and they say I'm too blessed to be stressed the Lord is good and they about to go down for the count can I tell you what you ought to do when you start going down you ought to look up and say Lord save me I dare you tonight just look up and say Lord save me can I tell you what the Lord will do if you just be humble enough to look up and say, Lord, save me. The Bible says immediately Jesus reached down and he pulled him up. Y'all missed a good place to shout. I didn't say that Peter reached up and pulled himself up. I said Jesus reached down and pull himself up and the only reason you on your feet now is not because you pulled yourself up but if it had not been for the Lord on your side where would you be well I would stop here because this is where most pastors and most preachers stop and have their celebration because the Bible says that he picked Peter up and now he was back up and that's where they shout but they miss shoutable material because the Bible says that they went back to the ship y'all missed it see he couldn't have been close to the ship because if he was close to the ship as soon as he started going down he'd have reached for the ship but he was too far out to reach for the ship but wait a minute Jesus didn't just pick him up but the Bible says they walked on the water back to the ship somebody still didn't get him he walked he sank was rescued and he walked again y'all still don't get it he walked he failed he cried out and god gave him another chance is there anybody in here who knows a god who can give you another chance notice if you will that i said he'll give you another chance i didn't say He'll give you a second chance because you way past your second chance. He's helped you so often that the only thing you can say is the Lord gave me. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Yes, he, did. he gave me another chance then the Bible says that they got back to the ship and the book says and the storm <laughs> ceased I like that once they got back in the boat 
the storm cease. Whatever else that means to me, it means that the storm ceased because it was just a test. The Lord didn't send them out in the storm to drown them. He sent them out there to teach them what is possible when you keep your eyes on Jesus. See, the reason why, I'm finished, but the reason why God lets you get in storms is because there are things about God that you can't learn unless you're in a storm. Come on, the old folks say, if I never had a problem, I wouldn't know God could solve it. I wouldn't know what faith in God can do. So listen, my brothers and sisters, the next time you're looking for something to shout about, next time you're looking for something to praise God about, don't just think about the good stuff. <laughs> think about some of the hell it brought you through. <laughs> because you are what you are in part because of some of the stuff that you've been through. And there's some stuff you've learned about God that you never would have known if you had never been in a storm. Listen, if you don't remember anything else I said to you tonight, please remember this. Get out of the boat.